Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session of the Civil Society uh, Forum. I think we can wait for maybe 10 to 20 seconds because I still see that some participants are joining. Okay, I think that we are good at 29 participants uh, right at this moment. So, ladies and gentlemen, especially dear fellows from the civil society organizations and think tankers, uh, I have the honor and the great pleasure of moderating this uh, session, which will uh, refer to the connectivity agenda, its achievements and challenges. Being in the civil society, we probably all know that the infrastructure gap is considered one of the key obstacles for the countries in the Western Balkans to catch up economically and speed up their accession process. While there are differences among the Western Balkan countries, they usually score lower than their EU peers in a number of parameters. For example, density of the highway and railway network, access to broadband internet, intensity of electricity production, length of electricity circuit, etc. Moreover, the economic exchange with the region largely lags behind the amount of trade and investments between these countries uh, and EU, which accounts for a significant untapped potential. And actually it's a missed opportunity for these countries to speed up their own development. This is the rationale behind the connectivity agenda, which is um, in a way the linchpin of the Berlin process. According to uh, the calculations, the initially planned investment back in 2014 of 7.7 .7 billion euros in infrastructure projects was supposed to contribute to an increase of 1% of the region's GNP and have a positive employment effect for around 200,000 people. And now we are at the end of this first programming period, so we are going to examine what has been achieved and let, what lessons can be learned for the future programming period 2021-2027, where according to the economic and investment plan launched by the EU uh, last year, there should be a volume of around 20 to 30 billion euros put at the disposal of the region in Soralia for infrastructure projects. Today we have with us three excellent speakers. Uh, I will start by introducing them in the way as they will take the floor for the first round of uh, introductory remarks. We have with us Mr. Michael Vogelek, who is the head of section of the WBIF, Indigenier, the European Commission. We have with us Mr. Mark Mateza Koinshek, who is the director of the transport community, and also Mr. Ardian Hachkai, who is the coordinator of Tirana Connectivity Forum, and also a research director at the Cooperation and Development Institute. So um, let us start with Mr. Vogelek. Could you please tell us a bit more about the, um, let's say the broader picture of the connectivity agenda and maybe what is most visible to the general public, the investment projects. Um, what have been the key achievements of the connectivity agenda in the past period? What lies ahead of us and what lessons have we learned until now? Thank you, Anna. Good afternoon, everybody from Brussels. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction and, and summarizing already to a large extent the connectivity agenda. A warm uh, hello also to my fellow panelists, uh, Adian and, and Mathieu. Um, let me introduce myself briefly. I'm Michael Vögel. I am heading the team in the engineer that deals with the Western Balkan investment framework. That's what WBAF stands for. And you see that also in the slide, I've brought a small presentation to you. The Western Balkans investment framework is, is one of the, the engines, but not the only engine when it comes to the connectivity agenda and investment projects. And what I'll just take you through very, very briefly is um, where do we stand uh, and answer some of the questions that uh, Anna has just posed to me. Now, the connectivity agenda goes back to a pledge that has been made by our commissioner Hahn at the time. 
in 2015 that the EU would co-finance with 1 billion euros connectivity project in the area of transport, energy and digital in the Western Balkans. Um, and perhaps the first achievement is that I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that with uh, the adoption of the last package in 2020, we have fulfilled that pledge and we have indeed allocated and committed um, 1 billion um, euros from the EU budget as co-financing to eligible projects that we have uh, chosen under the Western Balkans investment framework upon proposal by the Western Balkan governments. And perhaps we can go already to the first slide so that you can see what we would like to achieve with that. It's quite a number of results that we would like to see. Um, we are talking, as I said before, about um, energy, energy security. Um, we are talking about motorways, um, energy security also in, in terms of gas as a transition fuel. Uh, we're talking about different modes of transport, intermodal transport. We talk about railway lines, uh, waterways, maritime ports, inland ports, um, as well as obviously also highways. Here you can see um, a slide which shows what we would like to achieve at the end with the projects, with the investments uh, that we are supporting um, under the connectivity agenda between 2015 and 2020. I'm not going to read out everything to you. I think that's going to be boring. You can see that very easily. And I suggest in, to save some time and we go already to the next slide. This is where we stand right now. And, um, and there you see that next to the 1 billion euros, we also have committed um, and um, more than 120 million euros in grants for technical assistance. What does that mean? This technical assistance is there to prepare for mature investments. Um, it would go into, for example, environmental and social impact assessments that are necessary in order to uh, um, get the funding, the funding being a blending between an, an EU grant and a loan from an IFI or a development bank that works under the WBAF. And we also provide technical assistance in order to mature these investments. You will see there what we'd like to achieve. Um, you see the figures, you see the jobs that we believe have already been created. But you also see that out of the 45 projects that have been approved, only 16 have started their works. Um, 11 more will start construction in 2021, but only three projects will be completed in 2021. And there are a number of reasons, and perhaps we can talk about the reasons later on. But that is clearly to say when we talk about achievements, we can't see the full achievements yet because the result is not yet there on the ground. And I think we should be very clear and honest about that. Let's go to the next slide. This is just an example to show you um, one of the reasons why it, it might take longer than perhaps somebody who is not involved in the sector might assume when we are talking about uh, such projects as um, take a railway project, Obviously, this takes very long to plan and it also takes long to implement. The information that you see on that, on this slide here, is an information that is publicly available on our website, the WBF website. And you can clearly follow where we stand at each point in time, or I would say almost real time, um, with a project in terms of the various um, steps that are needed in, in order to implement a project. Um, I would leave it here. You can find that on our website. It's just to give you an example how you can retrieve information, how you can find information, where do we stand with, with the projects. And there you see also on the right side, um, the works 100% complete when we expect these projects to be eventually fully completed. Let's move to yet the next slide. Because I also want to talk a little bit about the future, because I understand that you have had already sessions today and participated in sessions also with the participation of colleagues from the European Commission. My director was there in the morning. Also, another colleague was there um, to talk about the green agenda for the Western Balkans. Now, in October um, 2020, the Commission has adopted um, an economic investment plan for the Western Balkans. And if you want, this is the successor of 
the connectivity agenda because we are not sitting idle and we simply say that that's the connectivity agenda let's see that these projects are being implemented on the contrary we now um, see against the background of the COVID-19 crisis as well as uh, the aspirations of the Western Balkans stepping further towards um, joining the European Union more has to be done and that more has been spelled out in the economic investment plan for the Western Balkans which is a communication of the commission it talks about the support to um, the economic recovery based on a green a digital transition um, and it goes very much along the lines that Anna you mentioned before bringing um, the uh, Western Balkans closer to Europe closing the gap closing the economic gap but also closing the economy econ um, the connectivity uh, gap there, um, also creating a common uh, regional market in the Western Balkans as a precursor to joining the EU single market. There are new elements, and I think that is important to note, and these new elements is that we are now having the green and uh, digital transition, and um, we widen the scope of our engagement beyond connectivity, also to um, areas such as um, the environmental sector, um, where we talk about renewable energy and um, we talk about sustainable transport there. Uh, you see here that I mentioned already, we talk about an increased regional economic cooperation and we have set out also a steep increase in funding for that. Now, one thing that's quite important and I'm, I'm sure um, that um, Mattia will afterwards talk about that, this is not just a funding plan. This is a blueprint also for reforms. And it's very, very clear that um, these investments will not bear fruit unless there are in parallel reforms in various areas um, that are necessary in order to bring the Western Balkans closer to the European Union. Then um, let's go to, to the next slide just to explain to you that there are six investment windows under this economic investment plan. And I already mentioned some of them. We're talking about uh, sustainable transport. We're talking about clean energy, the digital future. We talk about environment and climate. There is also an element of um, private sector development because um, while we have focused very much on public investments under the connectivity agenda, when we talk about reforms in the economy, um, it is absolutely necessary to take the private sector on board, uh, including for investments and not just private, but also public sector investments. And we talk obviously about human capital. There are a number of flagship projects suggested and attached to that, that have been drawn up in cooperation with the Western Balkan governments. And you can see these 10 flagship projects here. They are an annex to the um, economic and investment plan. Now I mentioned already the green agenda, the Green Agenda has been actually also published together with the Economic and Investment Plan, and that just shows also the importance that we attach to this change, this transition um, inside the EU, but also for our partner countries and in the Western Balkans. I think that already concludes my short presentation. I don't think there is another slide. Yes, there is one. Um, there is one with links. Please do not watch the YouTube videos and the like yet. Uh, stay with us in this panel. Um, and um, with that, I would like to end my opening remarks. Back to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vogele. You uh, touched upon a very important topic that I'm hoping that Mr. Zakonchek could further elaborate uh, for us and illustrate uh, in the example of the transport sector. So apparently physical infrastructure is not uh, sufficient for our countries to be better connected. And this is an area where the pace is not very quick by, by the nature of the, uh, of the projects that are being implemented. So when can we consider that our country are uh, well uh, connected and uh, what, what would be the benchmarks in the area of, the, of transport. And just before uh, giving you the floor, I would like to kindly encourage uh, our participants to ask questions. And uh, there are two ways uh, you can do that. Uh, we have already one question in the question and answer section. So uh, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A and we will uh, take them after the first round of introductory remarks. 
but also you can raise your hand so you use the, that uh, tool in the lower taskbar and you we will uh, give you the floor to ask the question or comment uh, directly um mr zakonishek please you have the floor Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. And of course, specifically to Ardian and Mikhail. Hello. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk about connectivity. So what brings us together? What connects us? Uh, the title of the session was uh, It is uh, Achievements and Challenges. And I was daring enough to add another title, which is Opportunities, because I think that this is what we also um, have to talk about. So allow me just to mention uh, basically a little bit about the achievement, because we also have to, you know, uh, to, to uh, recognize when we make a progress and talk about this. So allow me just to say a few words about that. First of all, I think one of the achievements in the last year was indeed signing the Transport Community Treaty in 2017. And then, of course, that became a reality in 2019. Why is this important? Not because of its document itself, but because the region itself has recognized and dedicated themselves to really build on the transport network in the region from the policy side, as well as from the network side, based on EU legislation, and to really connect the transport markets and integrate the transport markets of the Western Balkans with the EU. That is really you know, uh, the shift of perception. So that dedication and, uh, of course, the political direction uh, is one. This, uh, at the same time, in the last years, the, uh, the region has recognized that connectivity really needs a regional approach. And that is important for the Western Balkans, but is in, uh, equally important for the EU. Because, of course, the EU will never be connected and the transport networks will never be complete without of those, the same networks, be also completed in the Western Balkans. So this focus on the connectivity as a driver for jobs and growth and more opportunity, and of course, with that, this peace and prosperity. And as uh, Michael said, this is also what is in the heart of economic and investment plan for the Western Balkans from Commission, and this is, of course, our guiding principle. Um, again, another achievement which was happening in the COVID-19 pandemic, I want to highlight is green lanes. So basically, within the Western Balkans, it was in the March last year, it took only one month for the Western Balkan regional participants with the help of European Commission, SEFTA and TCT, to organize the transport of most essential goods throughout the region when this was needed. This happened in one month, and it's really a symbol of good cooperation and what can happen when everybody is looking in the same direction. Now, challenges. Exactly what you have mentioned uh, in the beginning. One thing which is extremely important that it needs to happen in parallel is that projects and policy reforms are happening at the same time. Why is this important? Because we can have a beautiful new roads, but if we do not have a maintenance plan, if these roads are not built or the rail or anything else are not built to the highest standards when it comes to environment, when it comes to resilience and so on, then basically we'll be able to rebuild these roads over and over again every few years. We need to start thinking of transport as a network. Uh, most of the investments in the last 30 years went into the road network. Now we really need to think about the other parts of the network and to really connect this and so that we will have one transport network and not only a network of roads or anything else. Third, decarbonization. Decarbonization of transport is the top of our agenda. And here the commission has published sustainable and smart mobility strategy for the for entire Europe. And we have replied to that with sustainable and smart mobility strategy for the Western Balkans. This is what has to be in the top of the agenda of everybody. Again, the challenge, borders. Green lanes is a good example of what can happen, but we need to go much further in order to reduce the waiting time at the border crossing points. So currently the citizens and especially the businesses wait too long at the borders. So this challenge of thinking globally, planning regionally and really acting locally still need to become really the second nature. And then the opportunities to finish, investment in rail, projects as well as policy, reconnecting the capitals with intercity express train. Here, all the capitals in the region, 
except from Tirana to Belgrade is a little bit more than 500 kilometers, about 600 kilometers, everything else is less than 500 kilometers. This means an amazing opportunity for a rail connections between the capitals with a fast rail connection. Investment in ports and inland, water, uh, inland waterways connected, of course, with rail and intermodal units. And of course, I think the biggest opportunity for the region is really to become the heart of the connectivity, not only within the Western Balkans, but also for Europe and between Asia and Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for putting into perspective the policy reforms uh, without which probably physical infrastructure would be pointless. And in that respect, uh, civil society, given its uh, role as watchdogs and uh, feeding in policy recommendations in, in the policy process, uh, has a role to play. Although until now, the connectivity agenda has been predominantly the realm of, of the national government. But luckily, now we have with us a spokesperson for the civil society, uh, Ardian. Um, so could you, you have been working in these issues from the perspective of civil society for a number of years. Uh, could you tell us what would be the added value of including civil society in a more meaningful manner in the connectivity agenda? And uh, what are the preconditions in order to be able for, uh, for CSOs to be able to actually be uh, engaged in the connectivity agenda? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here and to speak up for the person who is in charge of the infrastructure, the person who is in charge of the reforms. And now I'll talk about the beneficiaries, but I'm not in charge of the beneficiaries, but I'll talk a little bit about how the citizen may, may see in the Western Balkans. Uh, but first I will start by saying that we are very, very, very happy to finally hear the European Union talk about projects, because until very lately, EU has been talking about how much money they've been pouring into the Western Balkans, but it has been unable, I mean, at least for the population to see it on the ground. It's changing, it's all for the best. Uh, the second one, and this is mostly thanks to the, to the project and infrastructure, the tangible ones, but also at the smaller times of waiting in the borders. Uh, the second point is that uh, I can say that uh, I'm in this panel with three friends, uh, with Anna, of course, because we have been working together as well, but also with the representative of the WBAF and the representative of the transport community. It's, uh, we know this, lastly, a very noticeable increase on the engagement and on the visibility of both infrastructure. We can see it from the trove of documents that WBAF has started uh, during the last year to put in his website, but also by the frequent traveling that you might are doing in the region. And this is all the, all the more relevant. <clears throat> and I will start with the point of, I mean, with a comparison. Uh, first of all, uh, I will put together the IPA 3 uh, amount of, I mean, total budget, which is around 13 billion euros for the period until 2027, uh, 2027, and the 29 billion euros of the economic and investment plan. So basically, it's 13 billion and uh, 29 billion. I mean, some of some are the same, but the problem is that what we do not see uh, from the point of view of the citizen in the Western Balkans is that we do not see a clear benchmark or conditions for the conditionality for the way this 29 billion euros, nine in grants and 20 in loans, will be uh, awarded or how they will be spent. And uh, this accountability issue, it's uh, all the more concerning for us when uh, we uh, realize that in front of us we have governments the connectivity agenda is by design managed by the government that uh, are captured in the sense that the political will uh, it's not always there this is the first thing and the second one when we also take into account the poor governance as expressed by the weak administrative capacity of national institutions to design implement and operate big projects so basically uh, we have a number of significant challenges for example, uh, the way uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure financing is done is based on merit. So, uh, I mean, tens of billions of euros can go to certain or are channeled to certain governments that may be, let's say, uh, a little bit uh, lax on certain uh, issues 
of enlargement. This is a on oral chapters, progress and chapters. This is, a, this, is a, this is a very important thing. The second one is that we also can see an increase, an increased presence of third actors that profit from this, uh, let's say, uh, lacks or absence of conditionality and from the eagerness of the local elites to bypass good governance rules in uh, the large infrastructure projects. And uh, this is how we can see uh, big projects with big budgets that change in the middle of the implementations. Uh, this is, we can see how we are, countries are implementing hundreds of millions of euros in infrastructure projects that are not too much needed. We can see how the design uh, is not always the best and results in changes during the project implementation and increased budget. Or the latest uh, invention right now is special laws. Laws that allow, that allow our governments to contract without procurement huge amounts of money. Uh, so basically, uh, what coming to the question, what the CSO can do? Uh, the CSO, we want basically to disrupt the role that our elites or captured elites, political elites and economic elites or oligarchs have on those projects. So basically, and this we believe this can become by uh, starting to, uh, let's say, involve or embed uh, good governance rules and norms in infrastructure projects that our governments must apply. This can take the forms of appropriate benchmarks and monitoring mechanisms that we can be able to, to follow and to monitor and to, well, let's, for the moment, signal. Uh, we uh, want to, um, let's say, also use this fantastic opportunity of uh, connectivity agenda to somehow repair the ruptured accountability, democratic accountability mechanisms. Uh, given that it's more and more difficult to, um, for the citizen to control our governments through the elections every four years, it seems that we have whatever we vote, we keep the same leaders. Maybe it will be easier for us to have our say and to do to, to have our I mean to act um, when they spend the biggest part of the budget. This is in the infrastructure. If we can have a bigger say from in the all the project phases, this can be somehow compensation for the rupture uh, democrat uh, for the damage democratic accountability mechanisms. And finally, I would say that. Uh, Infrastructure is the soft belly of the EU enlargement because regarding at least the economy, it can derail the whole conditionality mechanism uh, as monitored by economic and reform programs components by affecting midterm macroeconomic projections. The number of projects, I mean, of the debt that is hidden debt in Albania can be an example, for example, um, the three year budgetary plans or the structural reform agenda. So uh, to include, uh, we would very much like to include the infrastructure project complete cycle uh, conditionality. I mean, uh, we are developing clear ideas of, of how it can work, but maybe that awarding 100 million euro projects only on the merit of the dossier, uh, it's okay, it should be done, otherwise the banks will not finance it, but maybe we can ask, we can also add uh, some other issues about the governance. Second, uh, maybe we can see how we can adapt the con con uh, connectivity agenda financing mechanism to increase the accountability of all the actors that are involved. And uh, we would like to be, given that the citizens are the best partners of the EU enlargement, we would act and we will act uh, to be the best partners of, uh, of you guys in setting up monitoring mechanisms and benchmarks, basically from watchdogs we want to be the owners of our own projects, and I will stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Arvian, very to the point. And I think that it will be actually encouraging and inspiring for uh, all the representatives of civil society organizations to, to actually voice uh, their opinion and their ideas, because I'm uh, pretty much sure that in every one of the, the countries, there have been uh, certain governance issues related to, to uh, infrastructure projects where civil society can actually play a role or somehow mitigate the negative effects. Uh, and uh, we already have uh, started to receive some questions and I will take one which is very much in line with one of the issues uh, that has been 
uh, raised uh, regarding corruption. It's actually a question uh, for Mr. Vogela. Uh, given that the Western Balkan states are all more corrupt now than they were six years ago, and that several have been termed at a, as at being at risk of total state capture, uh, and also given that major infrastructure projects are a primary vehicle for money laundering and other kinds of uh, crime and corruption, um, the question is twofold. Has corruption impacted the existing connectivity project in the, the agenda, connectivity agenda? And what is the European Commission doing to address these uh, issues? Thank you, Anna. Um, let me try to answer that question and also some of um, the comments that um, Adrian has made in terms of accountability. I think it's important to, to state that the projects that we are talking about, these investments, they don't fall from the sky. There is a long, long process of planning, of identifying the projects. And that's where I would see a clear role for civil society organizations to engage. We are indeed, and Adian is correct, talking about capital investments and capital investments in infrastructure means that there is a lot of money allocated it from state budgets, um, but it should be done so in a transparent manner. For that matter, for example, and, and that would be one of the answers that I can give, we would not on the EU side support projects that are not featuring on the single project pipeline or national investment plans of the beneficiaries of our best and Balkan partners concerned. These have to be planned. These have to be also foreseen in the annual budgets of our partners, because otherwise we are, we are talking about ideas that will never, <clears throat> never see the ground. And in that, we need to get the ideas right. <clears throat> Excuse me, we need to, we need, I mean, not we, but you need in the Western Balkans, the, you need to get the ideas right and in the investments right. And I think that's a very important starting point to look at. Um, and to influence the way these investment, um, single investment pipelines are being drawn up. When we then enter from that into the, um, into the choices that are being made in, in order to support projects, um, Adrian, on our side, it's very clear and um, that we will support projects that are of a priority also um, when it comes to connectivity in the EU, we, are, we, we have a framework there, we call it the 10T framework, um, which is currently in the process of being extended to the Western Balkans, i.e. it's not just uh, identifying any road, it's identifying the most important roads, the links that Mati has mentioned before, on which we engage. And, and I can give you some examples, there is a very important example that will, under the connectivity agenda, actually see um, quite some progress. And that is the corridor 5C in Bosnia Herzegovina, where really a lot of construction works are going on in order to improve traveling on, on, on this more north uh, south line or, or north uh, north south uh, west line. So this is an important element. Once the decision is taken that this that there should be an investment on any of such stretches, the next um, process starts, and that's the planning process. Identify when we're talking about transport links the right route and there are concerns there are concerns of citizens that are impacted there are concerns when it comes to the environment that is impacted there is an environmental and social impact assessment carried out and that's mandatory for us it's mandatory also for the IFIs that we are that we are dealing with and that's also an element where civil society organizations are coming in um, identifying not just the right investment but uh, the right size of the investment, the right route of the investment. And then lastly, um, and that's also an important element that I, I would like to stress, and I'll remain on that for a moment, public procurement, public tendering procedure. We will not award any project that doesn't follow a public tender. Um, and this public tender is being also supervised in our case and, and that's an answer to the question in the in the um, in the chat by the IFIs that do provide a non-objection to a tender. Um, it is when we talk about public funds important that these public funds are 
allocated in a, in a transparent way and that the decision on the um, company or the companies involved is carried out in line with, with the national legislation in a transparent manner. This is where the, the third party is coming in because Adrian, you mentioned third parties. As a matter of fact, I hear more criticism on us when it comes to us that we put too many conditionalities and it is easier to go with the third partners. Now you're asking for even more conditionalities. Um, but I, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, a bit, Adrian. Um, these conditions are there for a reason in order to also award projects for the best um, and adequate budget, because the risk for those practices that uh, Yogi has described in, in his chat increases through backroom door deals, it increases through direct agreements without a public tender. Public tenders are there to guarantee that you get best value for money. And this is, I think, what you need to, as civil society, make sure that your governments, as is the same for us inside the European Union, adhere to, not just when it comes to WBAF, but across the board, because this is where you can, obviously not everything, but you can to a large extent um, exclude or at least prevent or limit the risk, uh, remedy the risk of the practices um, corrupt practices that I've mentioned in, in the chat. And I would leave it here for, for the time being. Perhaps two things, two words of clarification. Um, when we look in the future, we don't, we are now talking about the economic investment plan for the Western Balkans, which is um, partially overlapping in terms of the, the areas with the connectivity agenda, but goes beyond in particular with the emphasis on um, environment, climate change, uh, renewable energies which goes beyond what we have done in, in, the, in the connectivity agenda. When it comes to the budgets that were mentioned, these budgets still have to go um, to uh, um, the European Parliament. Um, we have a regulation in place where we, where we listen um, for any project that we are proposing um, to our member states. Um, we present it to the member states. We, we discuss these projects with uh, the national IPA coordinators in your countries and um, only after they have gone through the, the Western Balkans investment framework board, they will, um, they can, they can be adopted. When it comes to the funding, this is IPA, IPA 3 funding and, and you mentioned correct that the funding goes, um, is, is up to 8 billion out of the 12 billion. This is not all for WBF and it's not all for, for capital investments just to avoid a misunderstanding. The 20 million um, that you have referred to, Adian, that is indeed um, what we do also inside the European Union. Um, this is a leveraging effect going through the, the private sector with um, guarantees. I just wanted to clarify that so that there is no misunderstanding. And back to you, Anna, on that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we had Gudrun Steinecker uh, raising a hand, uh, but also leaving a, a, a question or answer in the, um, in the Q&A uh, section. So I just wanted to make sure uh, whether Gudrun still wants to, to join the discussion, or if not, I will then, uh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. Can I speak? Yes. This is. Um, no, um, I just uh, uh, wanted to uh, raise a question with regard to civil society. I know that in countries which are in negotiations uh, for EU membership, uh, like Montenegro, which I know uh, a little bit better as a former M German ambassador there, and in Serbia, uh, actually the government is obliged to include uh, civil society. Um, but uh, the reality on the ground is very often different. And if the um, civil society is too critical, uh, governments uh, find always ways uh, practically either to ignore them or even uh, to exclude them. So how will the EU um, make sure that civil society is included and that uh, civil is listened to and that uh, the um, that the government cannot just uh, ignore what uh, civil society 
has to say. Um, I think of some projects which I, uh, infrastructure projects which I saw uh, in uh, Montenegro, which were highly questionable and they were just, the government pushed it through and uh, at the EU was not very helpful in that matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that this is a question where all three uh, panelists can uh, can contribute and raise their ideas. But I would also encourage the the other uh, participants if they have uh, uh, good ideas or questions or comments to to join um, our discussion. Um, so, um, who would like to start? How do we make the EU involve civil society? Arvia, go ahead. I'll just start by commenting uh, on what Michael said, that he said EU would not finance projects that do not uh, figure in the NSTP. We know this. However, uh, this is uh, the problem is that uh, EU will open up by not doing this, you will open up to competition from third parties. That is happening already. So basically, it will be a self uh, inflicting wound. And the second one is that NSTP, it's not always the most representative of what the, what the country needs. I mean, uh, the civil society, I civil society citizens are not always heard when the NSTP is prepared. For example, in the case of um, Adriatico Ionian Highway, the municipality of Škodra in Albania didn't know until last year uh, what was the relation to affect its municipality. So this, this is the first thing. The second one, you said that you all, I mean, Connectivity agenda projects that will always be through public tender. Well, I can quote you at least a latest example when a tender of, I don't know, around 500 million euros was allowed through a special law, was done through a special law without any other procedure, and they are becoming more and more frequent. And not only, I mean, and there are many, many third actors there, not only those that come from very far away. What I want to say here is that we are, citizens are the natural allies of the European Union. And uh, what I'm trying to point out, and what we are trying to do here, is that we find ourselves, and what Ms. Uh, Steinmacher said, in a catch 22 situation is that we are obliged to work with the government to work on capital investment and also on reforms. But at the same time, we are not sure that those governments represent our interests and they have the enlargement or the integration at heart when working with the European Union. What we are asking and what we are doing is trying to make uh, more visible um, our concern because this is our money, this is European taxpayers' money, this is the first thing on how those projects should advance, but also promote our expertise because at the end of the day, me personally, Anna, and other also colleagues that are probably following this webinar also work have, or have worked in, in, the civil, uh, in the civil service in different institutions and have knowledge and input that can be very valuable for, I mean, always representing uh, the point of view of the citizen and enriching the projects, increasing their quality, but also representing the citizen. We had the last uh, example, uh, last week, Monday was in, uh, in Romania, in Burris, fantastic opening ceremony of the Center for, of Excellence for Maritime Affairs. It was a beautiful opportunity because we had together a publicly owned company, the Tourist Sport, uh, Transport Permanent Secretariat, University and the Think Tank working together. I think more examples like this can be promoted somehow. Contributing, being positive. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ardian. Uh, Mr. Zakonshev, would, would you like to join uh, this aspect about this inclusion of civil society? Thank you very much. Um, indeed, it's a very good question because uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, connectivity agenda is very interesting for, um, for government because, of course, it's also very visible and it's very easy to explain. It's much easier to explain connectivity and transport than it is to explain uh, things which require, let's say, more kind of policy reforms and they're not as visible on the ground as the new you know, railway line or the decreased waiting at the border and so on. And that's why also I think the government are getting better and better at communicating what they're trying to do for, of course, obvious reasons. At the same time, we also need to make sure that civil society 
is equally um, clear in the communication when it comes to the connectivity project. And that that is not, uh, let's say, um, uh, reserved for the technicians of it only, or you know the engineers of it, but also people who care about how money is spent, where the uh, different projects are designed, the impact on the local communities, environment, and so on. So, um, and one thing that we are promoting uh, as the transport community, and of course that hand in hand with the, our European partners, European Commission, is sustainability. It's the sustainability with a big S. So not only environmental sustainability, but also fiscal, uh, social, and every other aspect. And here I would really, uh, like um, Ardian said, we need to use the events like the one today, uh, just happening now, the one that was in uh, Dures just a few days ago, to really put together everybody. And not because uh, the, we need to bring uh, together people just for the sake of the voices to be heard, but because the policymakers can also make a better choices. It is very clear, and that is the example from all other policy areas, that the best policy decisions happen when there are a lot of voices around the table, sometimes even competing, even arguing, but the best policy choices and then the projects that follow happen when that happens. So this is something that we are very much promoting within the transport community, but we are also really trying to put together not only transport, but also to build the community. So this is really in the heart of what we are doing. But the only way is really working together, be loud, be present, and of course, our doors are always open, and I'm sure that I can say the same for, for, the, for our partners around the table. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Kolkan. Well, uh, let, me, let me come in at the end. Um, I think Mati has almost said it all. I think it is indeed um, very important to have that discussion and, and look at that sustainably in the way of incorporating civil society organizations. Um, so that is very, very clear. The target is mostly the, the partner countries because that's where the decisions are taken. But rest assured, um, we'd also be um, welcoming proposals that are made when it comes to, to the European Union, because also on our side, we are spending uh, public budgets and, and we should um, obviously stand the same scrutiny as the governments in the Western Balkans. So that is very, very clear. I think it's, it's uh, a good example to have these workshops um, and, and come up with, with practical proposals. To say also that when it comes to the enlargement process as such, the engagement of civil society is something that is, I would say, even a mainstreaming topic um, that, that goes across, that is um, supported in that process um, through consultations. We do look very carefully at the reforms and what is happening or not happening in the countries. You know, the regular reports, um, but there are other fora in which we discuss with the governments um, under the stabilization agreements and association agreements, for example, things that go well, but also things that do not go well. Um, because many practices that you have mentioned, um, Adian, they do, they are not in line with, with, uh, with uh, the way we see these, these agreements with the Western Balkans. Um, and then among partners, we need to put that on the table and we need to name, uh, name that and, and also provide our opinion. We do in this context obviously also listen to civil society organizations in order to inform our opinion. Yes, we do have delegations on the ground, that is clear. But as you pointed out, Adian, we're not the only ones that have the expertise. Um, and, and therefore it is, it is indeed good to listen to partners. So I'm, I'm personally looking forward to also um, getting proposals out of this, of this budget, how you see critically our role in that. Um, and, um, and I think I leave it here for the time being, yes. Thank you very much. This was uh, an open call for uh, other uh, CSO uh, fellow participants in, in, the, uh, in this session to uh, raise their specific recommendations if they, if they have some. 
And in the meantime, I uh, would like to make a link to one of the working groups that are uh, happening within this uh, CSO forum uh, that actually Ardian was uh, moderating just before this session. So we actually have the opportunity to provide uh, our recommendations, to streamline them through this uh, group and to submit them uh, thanks to, to this forum and to the organizers, not only to the European uh, Commission, but also to, to national authorities and to a broader range of stakeholders that are involved in the connectivity agenda. So feel free to, to join the discussion. We have approximately five minutes uh, left during this session. And if not, to join maybe the working group on the connectivity agenda tomorrow and share also with us our uh, your um, insights. If uh, we do not uh, have any uh, questions or comments from the audience, I would uh, like to go back to something that Mr. Zakunshek mentioned. You mentioned sustainability uh, with a big S and also uh, referring to your um, area of work, which is transport. Uh, one of the highlights that, that uh, is, uh, I think, uh, applies to all the countries in the region is actually railway. So we are all very much looking forward to seeing uh, fast railways uh, being uh, deployed uh, throughout all the, the capitals um, in the region. But as you already mentioned, there should be some policy reforms in order to encourage that because rail, um, at least speaking from North Macedonia and I believe also in, in other countries, is simply not a very attractive uh, mode of transport for passengers and even less uh, in recent years for, for freight. So what, what would be the, the way to achieve this sustainability? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an excellent question because I truly believe that the future of transport in a lot of sense is on tracks. And, um, and this is exactly what we are really focusing, especially during this year, which is the European year of rail. We are really putting the rail um, on the agenda. And uh, first of all, the, what you have also said, uh, I cannot agree more, that transport, so the policy reforms and the projects need to go hand in hand. And here, the interesting fact is that that, of course, doesn't always mean completely new tracks. That, in a, most of the cases, actually needs, means modernization of the current network. As you know from the region, we were traveling faster as well as with better connections 30 years ago than we travel today. So actually, if the the rail tracks will be just modernized, even to the design speeds, which were designed perhaps 10, 20 years ago, the difference between the speed of a current train would go from 40 to maybe 90 kilometers per hour, which will be two times more than currently. So these are the, really the elements which are very much uh, putting attention. And the second one is, of course, that this rail needs to be connected with other modes of transport, being, being on the roads or being with the ports on the inland waterways, or the, um, of course, the ports here in Albania or in uh, Montenegro in order to really create uh, the rail market. So, and of course, this is my last part. The rail market is something that the only rail market which will be sustainable, also fiscally sustainable within the Western Balkans is the one connected to the rest of the EU. Because that is, then you get the space big enough in order to have the rail which will actually serve not only the entire region, that's only one step, but entire EU. And really this is where, you know, that's why the investments in rail are so important. At the same time, the policy reforms, which make sure that when the rail reforms happen and when the rail projects happen, that is connected to the neighboring countries and of course to the region as such. Now, allow me also to say that when we are looking at the rail projects in the region, uh, why am I so confident that a lot of investments will go into the rail in the future? Because also the major financial institutions, specifically the European one, will want to invest in the projects in the region which help decarbonization. So currently, getting the pure road projects approved in the future will become increasingly hard if this road project doesn't have a clear also a green agenda, such as charging stations, uh, resilience of the network and so on. So that's why the rail and the rail network is really something as the most decarbonized way of travel. It is where we hope and we are already seeing that the projects will uh, very much uh, put pace. And if you see all the projects which are in the pipeline on the rail, 
in today and in coming years, I do believe that the rail network in the region will become much, much different in five years time than it is now. I really appreciate your optimism and I think it, it actually provides uh, all the, the, the participants with some uh, encouragement that maybe we will soon be taking trains to meet for uh, such a civil society forum, but it is also a policy area where uh, I think that our uh, civil society colleagues would very much like to, to uh, delve more in depth in order to, to explore and, and uh, seek for some ways to, to improve and provide their contribution. Um, so uh, I would like to thank you for, for this uh, discussion. And I believe that we have a lot of food for thought that we will be taking with us from, from this session. And before uh, uh, closing the, 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 the discussion, this session, I would like to uh, give the floor to Dr. Christian Hagemann from Sudest Europa Gesellschaft, who has a few uh, information to share with us. Yeah, thank you, Anna, and a uh, brief hello also from me. Thank you all for bearing uh, with us for this entire day of online conferencing. Uh, I do hope that it was both an interesting as well as a good experience when it comes to the technical parts of this gathering. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to draw your attention to a special feature of our conference platform, which is the networking space uh, that you can enter via the cafe building on our main page. And some of you might have tried it already. Um, we use for this the tool Spatial Chat, which is actually really good. So for those of you who have already given up on these kinds of tools because they never worked so well in the past, this one clearly deserves another chance, I would say. So give it a try and see who's there, um, have interesting discussions and maybe even add some points from these discussions as comments on the Future of Europe conference page uh, we have created on the platform in which you can enter by clicking on uh, the plane that is flying over our conference buildings on the main square uh, page. So um, the networking space will also be available tomorrow uh, throughout the entire day. So there's also a chance to meet there then and, and try everything then. So for now, thank you very much for this day of fruitful discussions. Thank you to the last panel um, and see you all hopefully tomorrow morning at 9.30 back here. Have a nice evening.